Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. country's major corporations seeking to crush union organization have filed legal papers to shut down the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, the federal agency that enforces labor rights and oversees unionization efforts. Elon Musk, SpaceX, as well as Amazon, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's have targeted the NLRB after it accused Amazon, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of breaking the law and battling against unionization, as well as accusing SpaceX of illegally firing eight workers for criticizing Elon Musk. The attempt to get the federal courts to overturn the 89-year-old National Labor Relations Act, which has governed labor relations since Franklin Roosevelt was president, is one more assault in the war against workers by corporations and Wall Street. Laws and regulations put in place by the New Deal have been steadily dismantled. The NLRB, for example, has already been rendered largely toothless. It is unable to fine corporations for breaking the law, including when corporations fire workers who are attempting to organize. If NLRB judges are declared unconstitutional, the goal of the legal challenge, it would halt judges from hearing hundreds of cases brought against corporations for violating labor laws. This latest attack on workers is part of a broader, decades-long assault that includes the mass layoffs of workers and costly stock buybacks to enrich shareholders at workers' expense. This assault has not only caused financial distress among the working class, it has not only seen wealth funneled upwards into the hands of the billionaire class, but has had negative repercussions for our society and our democracy. The Democratic Party's abject betrayal of the working class, especially in rural America, lies at the heart of the rise of a demagogue like Donald Trump. Rather than halt this corporate pillage, the victims of this assault are demonized as ignorant, racist bigots, those Hillary Clinton called deplorables. They are written off as a lost cause politically. The statistics, however, point to a strong correlation between the decline of the Democratic Party and mass layoffs along with onerous trade agreements that ship manufacturing jobs to Mexico and China. The claim by many Democrats and pundits, such as New York Times columnist Paul Krugman, that there is a massive, reactionary, working-class, populist base in America is a fiction. Even the January 6, 2021 storming of the U.S. Capitol, it turns out, was not, in fact, a white working class riot. But it is easier to dismiss the white working class rather than ameliorate their very real suffering. This failure to act is ominous. As labor journalist Hamilton Nolan writes, the people who fancy themselves as the captains of the ship are actually the wood-eating shipworms who are consuming the thing from the inside until it sinks. Joining me to discuss the war on workers and how it imperils what is left of our anemic democracy is Les Leopold, who co-founded the Labor Institute and is the author of Wall Street's War on Workers, How Mass Layoffs and Greed Are Destroying the Working Class and What to Do About It. So your book, uh, I think, makes a very convincing case that uh, the defection of the white working class in particular, which is you know, largely often rural, uh, is uh, caused by this economic distress. Um, and you have lots of uh, data and statistics and charts uh, to uh, back it up. Uh, but I want to begin, as you do in the introduction, uh, you lay out the uh, cost the emotional cost to workers 
who lose their jobs. Um, I, you write that it's the seventh, uh, considered the seventh most stressful life event, uh, ranked more stressful than divorce. Um, that recovery from the psychological trauma of job loss takes two years on average. Uh, you talk about uh, developing new health conditions rise by 83%. I think that that, and I, I've seen that among my own family in Maine. Let's talk about, just to begin, what that job instability does to one's physical and emotional state. Well, I saw this in my own family. Uh, my father was a factory worker, and uh, when he was laid off through a mass layoff, it was uh, traumatic. He felt terrible about himself. Uh, we were fortunate that my mother had a full-time job, and uh, so you know we didn't completely crash economically, but he just felt pretty worthless. Uh, this Another fortunate thing was this happened to be during the recessions of the early 1960s, and when the economy picked up, he got a job and he basically was able to hold it for the rest of his uh, career. But today, what's happened is it, uh, then it was during recessions. That's when you'd see mass layoffs. Corporate uh, CEOs were embarrassed to do mass layoffs. They thought it was a sign of their own failure. Now it's a sign of financial prowess. Good times, bad times, it doesn't matter. So you're seeing people go from one mass layoff to the next mass layoff, and it's totally debilitating. Uh, you feel terrible about yourself. It's, it's hard. It becomes increasingly hard to make ends meet. And you feel let down by your society. Everybody talks about the economy, the economy, the economy. What does it mean? If a, if a democratic uh, country and its economy can't produce a modicum of stable employment, you're in trouble, and the pe people start losing faith in, in the system all around them. Some, you know, it, it's no accident that the uh, opioid uh, epidemic uh, grew up in this environment. It's no accident that people started to abandon uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, they just feel let down, and they don't know where to turn. And frankly, you know, where do we tell them to turn? Uh, uh, you know, the, I see a few politicians who are brave enough to take on Wall Street, and they're doing well, like Sherrod Brown in Ohio. But most people just duck. You know, they want to talk about something else, where they talk about jobs in the future. That's, that's the other thing I'm finding difficult to handle. I'm all for the infrastructure bills. I'm all for the CHIPS programs, all these things that create jobs in the future. But what is it going to do for the person that's laid off now? We had a, a plant go down in Olean, New York. That's on the southern tier right above Pennsylvania. Very rural, once very industrial. So a plant goes down there, and in a few years, a battery factory is opened up in Buffalo three, four, five hours away. I mean, it doesn't do anything for you. You're being told, move. Take your family, your life, and just rip it up and move. Anyway, this kind of pressure has been studiously ignored. Uh, so that was one finding of our book is, uh, as you've uh, mentioned, explained it very well, we found there was a high uh correlation, causal correlation between the rise of mass layoffs in the rural, especially in the rural counties in the blue wall states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the decline of the Democratic Party going back to 1996, not just during the Trump election. And the second thing we found that you mentioned uh, was that the white working class, especially in, the, in these rural areas, are not becoming more illiberal. They are not a basket full of deplorables. Yes, there's some people like that. We estimate nationally, maybe max 3% would fit into Hillary's basket uh, full of deplorables. Uh, I'm going to just give you one, the one statistic that uh, a couple that just blew my mind. Uh, when asked uh, 20 years ago whether uh, gay or lesbian couples should be able to adopt children, the white working class, on average, only about 38% said. They approved of that. Now with 76%. You know, the, the other one's probably it's probably for religious reasons or something. Uh, another one, how about legalization? This, this is an important one, because this is the one you would think would be completely hated by uh, the people, quote unquote, left behind. Uh, do you approve of granting citizenship to illegal immigrants? 
who've been here three years, no felonies, and have been paying their taxes. Well, 15 years ago, only about uh, 32% agreed with that statement. Now it's 61.6%. Almost two thirds now say, yes, we believe that there should be a a path to uh, legalization for undocumented workers. To me, that was phenomenal when I saw that. So, you know, uh, President Obama said, you know, this is the this is a certain there's a certain mental gymnastics that goes on here that that to rationalize this away. You say, yeah, we know that they've been left behind economically. A, there's nothing we can do about it because it's the forces of trade, it's the for, you know globalization and technology. And besides, the, it's their fault that they're clinging to guns and religion. We're not making them do that. Well, it turns out they're. You know, we saw no evidence that people were getting more religious. We saw no evidence that they're clicking to their guns. They're not more homophobic. They're not more racist. They're getting more liberal. And but they're angry. And as you said that very well, they're 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 disgusted that no one is reaching out for them to them, not just to pat them on the back or wear a hoodie and make them feel good like they look, you know, we look the same. No, people that will actually intervene and stop mass layoffs. That's what has to happen. Direct intervention to stop mass layoffs and the tricks that Wall Street plays to promote them. Leverage buyouts, stock buybacks. Um, We should just be clear, as you make clear in your book, that the uh, financial structures have changed with the rise of corporate raiders. We now politely call them private equity firms. And I did a good interview with uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, financial or business reporter Gretchen Morganson on her book on private equity. So, yeah. but the, so the model changes where you a private equity firm comes in and uh, harvests a, a corporation to sell off its assets, in essence to destroy it. They're not trying to sustain it, uh, and that has fueled. We we'll go back to certainly the, the Clinton would well we'll go back to Reagan probably, but uh, that has over the last few decades, seen wave after wave of mass layoffs. I wrote a book called America, the Farewell Tour and wrote a chapter out of Anderson, Indiana. That's where GM used to make its cars, good union paying jobs, a middle class city. Uh, They literally packed up the equipment and moved it to Monterey, Mexico, where they pay workers $3 an hour. And the city has fallen into a death spiral. Uh, with all of the attendant problems that you point out, opioid addictions, suicides, very high. Um, and yet the Democratic Party uh, just utterly fails to address this uh, issue. Uh, you write uh, Joe Biden, Chuck Schumer, and Bernie Sanders had golden opportunities during the pandemic to stop two significant mass layoffs one in Morgantown, West Virginia, the other, as you mentioned, in Olean, New York, the failure to act contrasts sharply with Trump's strikingly symbolic and partially successful effort to prevent the Carrier Global Corporation from moving jobs from its Indiana facility to Mexico in 2017. And I think this is an issue that many people who dislike Trump don't pick up on, although, of course, he's a con artist. But he does speak to this pain directly in a way that no other Democratic politician does with maybe the exception of Bernie Sanders and Sherrod Brown, of course. Well, look, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, First of all, it was a very self-conscious effort on the part of the Democrats and the Republicans from Reagan on to rip up the New Deal controls, get rid of the guardrails. Uh, just like you talked about the NLRB, that's another one they're now trying to get rid of. But but they, but basically, this uh, you know these corporate raiders, uh, the harvesters, uh, the, you know they that just wasn't going on before the deregulation. That was frowned upon. That was easily stopped. You you know SEC would walk in and say, no, you can't do that. Well, I, I just want to interrupt you as you point out in your book, stock buybacks were it used to be illegal. Yeah, well, it was basically so controlled that no more than 2% of corporate profits could go to stock buybacks. Now we're talking close to 70% of all corporate profits in society. And some companies, not just a handful, but you know, hundreds and hundreds, spend more than 100% of their 
profits on stock buybacks. They're basically taking their money and returning it, returning it, giving it to the largest uh, stock owners. They're not investors. These are stock sellers. And these are the hedge funds and other large institutions that uh, uh, swoop in, demand the stock buyback. Actually, that's why Carrier was moving to Mexico, not to keep up with the competition, but there were, uh, its parent company, United Technologies, had a uh, a bunch of hedge funds took a position in that company and said, we want a $6 billion stock buyback. So they figured, oh, we can save $60 million by moving our most profitable division to Mexico. Uh, and Trump did intervene. The story of, uh, uh, I'm, you know, it's so painful to bring this one up. But, you know, I connected with the president of the union at the Morgantown, West Virginia uh, facility. It's a, a Myelin Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole CD history there with uh, Joe Manchin's daughter. And uh, she got like 100 million. Right. They make they produce EpiPens for ten dollars and then sell them for hundreds of dollars. Right. But there's a whole bunch of uh, but let's put that aside. Uh, she was gone and the new owner wants to move it to India in the middle of the pandemic. And they're making generic products. Uh, so this local union was steel workers, former oil, chemical, atomic workers, pro- progressive. Uh, organized, and they got uh, they got Bernie Sanders uh, crew uh, our revolution to support them. They appealed to to Biden administration. They appealed to Bernie. They appealed to uh, Mansion. They even suggested to to the state government, why don't you buy the company and then we'll produce generic products for the VA and for uh, Medicaid. Pretty smart, right? Nobody did anything. So fifteen hundred of the very, probably the best blue collar jobs other than coal in all of uh, West Virginia, 1,500 jobs, average pay 70 grand goes under. And, and this is when he, they could have used the Defense Production Act. They did that with the uh, uh, baby formula uh, 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 just before this period, but they didn't want to do it. And I, I, can't, I can't figure out why. This was such an easy way to bring national attention to, we're not going to put up with mass layoffs. Uh, it's funny, the, the president of United Technologies had a great line. Uh, when they asked him, well, why did you give in to Trump? He goes, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. We get 10% of our revenue comes from federal contracts. Right. So there's $760 billion a year in federal contracts. What if you told them, guess what? From here on in, no more mass layoffs, no more stock buybacks. You don't want to do that? Don't take the contract. We'll find somebody else. Set up. It, it, it can, you can use the bully pulpit. You can use the federal uh, federal contract. Now, people will say, whoa, wait a second. You're messing with capitalism. It's not going to work. Well, you know what? These large corporations are enormously flexible. The other thing we found this is another sad one. Uh, that Olean plant uh, in upstate New York is uh, was Siemens Energy, 90,000 employees, uh, was spun off, but still connected to uh, Siemens, which has 400,000 employees, a German-based company. Well, uh, 1,700 uh, US workers lost their jobs when they uh, stopped making a certain kind of compressor for oil rigs or fracking or something. Uh, in Germany, 3,000 were gonna lose their jobs. But because they have co-determination there, half the board members are workers, including Union high-level union officials, they they did all these investigations, they did all these pressure tactics, and the company agreed to no compulsory layoffs. Plus, this is the part that was really mind blowing. There's you have, in other words, you have to buy the worker out before they uh, before they leave. Otherwise, you can't get rid of them. The six facilities that were making the product that they were shutting down, they agreed to put something else in the plant and keep the six plants open. So you could, that could be part of your federal contract. No compulsory layoffs, no plant shutdowns, no stock buybacks. It, but you have to interfere with uh, capitalist and Wall Street uh, prerogatives. That takes guts. Uh, and I keep asking myself, don't they see that it really works for Sherrod Brown in Ohio? I mean, you know, Bernie and Vermont and uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Warren and Massachusetts, those are, you know, Democratic states. But Ohio, Brown outpaced uh, 
uh, Trump by 15% in that in that uh, in 20 in uh, uh, 2020. So there, people respond to to those who are really trying to pr protect their jobs, uh, and it's, and and it just has to happen. My big fear is that the right is going to wake up. So they're going to see what Trump did. The polling, by the way, after that showed that was enormously popular with the American public and with Democrats, for that matter. They're going to wake up and say, you know what? Instead of going after these companies because they're so they're too woke or for diversity, let's go after them because of their layoffs. Now, that you, know, it, it, you make an interesting point that reminds me of Gaza, actually. I mean, so we have no leverage over Israel unless we stop the arms shipments. But it isn't going to happen. So we have no leverage. So the Democrats have no leverage over these large corporations because they won't halt these massive government contracts. And you have, I forget the name of the CEO, but when Biden does his infrastructure bill, signs it, he's standing next to what's the name of the woman who just uh, er eradicated all sorts of jobs. Um, right, right in front of him. Right. Yeah. And no, it's a, it, I I'm afraid that's what what's happened is uh, Schumer's famous line from 2016 has become the de facto policy. He said, "For every blue collar worker we lose in Western Pennsylvania, we're picking up two Republicans in the suburbs," and that goes for Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin as well. So that's essentially telling people you're writing them off. That there are there are more uh, uh, suburbanites than there are rural working class people or working class people in general. By the way, it's not just rural. You know, you're talking about Staten Island and Queens and other places. Uh, you know, in heavily rural, uh, urban areas, you've got. Uh, we found no difference, by the way, in people's attitudes whether they were urban, rural, or suburban uh, amongst the white working class. People are pissed. Uh, they don't want to be buffeted from job to job. They, you know, there. I can't remember who just wrote this. Uh, you, uh, a, a recent study, uh, and they were asking people what they felt about the economy, and it, almost to the person, they said, "Greed. It's rigged. It's rigged. People feel it's rigged against them, and that uh, the Wall Streeters are walking off with the money, and the CEOs, and that the politicians are uh, too eager to." Uh, Get campaign donations, and frankly, also have their eye on, oh, you know, maybe get a good Wall Street job after they leave office. Too many people are geared up that way, and it's and it's now permeated into the uh, political culture. The, everybody feels it unless they're really benefiting from it, and that's a very small number of people. Well, they are. they feel it because it's true. Uh, <laughs> it's not a feeling; it's a fact. Uh, exactly. And 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 so uh, not only do these corporations lavishly fund politicians like Barack Obama or the Clintons, but they take care of them as soon as they leave office. There's payback, uh, speaking fees, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, insane donations to their foundations, which allow them to spend their life flying around in Learjets, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it's just legalized bribery. Well, you, again, I keep asking myself, but why do they want to lose? Uh, you, could, you know, why would so many Democrats in uh, swing states with large rural populations, working class populations, why do they want to lose? I mean, Sharon Brown put out three essays with the title Wall Street's War on Workers. He did this, uh, you know, before the 2020 election. He did it in 2017, 18, 19. Why, why don't people see that they could actually do something to help working people by stopping these mass layoffs, opposing Wall Street, using that framework? That's what I'm saying. That frame is, I, see, it, 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 what blew my mind is, I believe that that framework is incredibly powerful. It it uh, showed up in all the uh, statistical work that we did to sort of prove that it was powerful. Then you get a guy like uh, uh, Mike Lux, the Democratic pollster. He's no radical. He did this report just recently, uh, a year ago, called Fact Factory Towns. And he, his conclusion is this. He says, uh, I'm close to the exact phrase. He says, uh, 
the working class wouldn't care that much about the woke thing if the Democrats gave a damn about the economy. Substitute the word mass layoffs for economy. And I think he's exactly right. And now, it, you know, we discover that Sheriff Brown's onto this framework as well. What's holding everybody back? Well, plus they'd win by a landslide if they actually push through FDR type, you know, New Deal reforms. But the Democratic leadership as it exists, 80 year old Biden, uh, Nancy Pelosi, they wouldn't exist because they're creatures of Wall Street. And their power comes from one that, that they're funded by corporations, but even more importantly, they control the flow of campaign or corporate donations to anointed candidates. So I think they'd rather go down in their privileged first-class cabins uh, than become politically irrelevant. Because if there was uh, a pivot where they actually challenged corporate power, the democratic leadership as it exists uh, presently would be eradicated. I mean, in a fair election, would not one saturated with corporate money, Bernie Sanders would have beat Hillary Clinton and probably would have beaten Donald Trump. I agree. I agree. You know, you know the story in the book that, uh, that we stumbled on uh, that, that really saddened me is the story of Mingo County, West Virginia. Can I dive into that one a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, this so, is the opioid capital. Yeah. So Bill Clinton wins uh, Mingo County, a small county in West Virginia, uh, had at the time that Bill Clinton won, uh, it had 3,300 coal jobs. He got 69.7% uh, of the vote, right? A, a landslide. Uh, every four years thereafter, the Democrat got less and less and less and less. And, uh, and this is, and Biden ends up with. 13.9%. I mean, that's a pathetic amount, right? Uh, you'd get more than that by far if you put if you if you were a write-in candidate in, in that area. I could I could run your campaign and get you more than 13.9%. So this county has an incredible history. This is where Mother Jones came and spoke during the Cold Wars of the early 20th century. There were uh, there was a, a basically a war going on there between the United Mine Workers, who was trying to organize, and you know the the, the thugs that were hired by the coal mine uh, coal industry. In fact, state and federal troops had to come in there uh, to basically put it under martial law. Well, they, and, there was an armed uprising in Letter Mountain for three days. They fought them off. Yep, and uh, finally, uh, with the New Deal and Roosevelt. Uh, uh, unions were recognized. The coal miners, uh, the coal, uh, United Mine Workers, started to prosper. Workers started doing better, and they rewarded the Democrats uh, with their votes. All right. So, what was going on between 1996 and uh, uh, 2020 in a, in a, a, a county that has 23,000 people in it? The coal mining jobs went from 3,300 to 300. So this was the perfect place for the Democrats to do a real workers work, work progress administration. You know, go from town to town, ask people what they need, and then create public jobs to produce what they need. They're going to say, we need better schools. Okay, build new schools. Our roads are falling apart. Build new roads. We don't have internet. Wire them up. We need better health care uh, facilities. Produce more health care facilities. Those, the strip mining uh Legacy has to be cleaned up. Start, you know, bring Conservation Corps in, clean those places up, get the, uh, the, the rivers below or polluted, fix them. There were tens of thousands of jobs to be created in Appalachia, in West Virginia, and thousands that could have been created just in Mingo County. And the Democrats didn't do anything, nor did the Republicans, but we didn't expect them to do anything. So they relied on, what did they rely on? The private sector. What did the private sector do? They can't. Too enterprising, <laughs> you can't make this up. A, uh, uh, a a guy who just got out of prison, uh, uh, being a pimp, set up a drugstore, got some uh, doctor to uh, uh, fill out prescriptions, uh, the, so that he could put out a 
prescription per minute. And then a second drug start competed with the first. That's free enterprise, right? You come in, take advantage of the market. This little county became the pill mill of America. Put out more. That one drugstore was the 22nd largest distributor of opioids in the whole country. You're talking, you know, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston. No, Mingo County, West Virginia, in the top number 22. You think these people are going to reward? The Democrats for creating a few handful of jobs in uh, in a drugstore. I mean, it, this this is a try. You could, you know, if I were try to write a spoof about how how to destroy yourself politically, I, I couldn't have made this up. And then on top of that, Wall Street came in and fed on the carcass of these coal coal mines that were going under, and with tried to rip the benef- uh, the health benefits away from the, the coal mining retirees. Uh, and that was all legal. Uh, you know, UMW, the union fought them very hard, but a lot of coal miners lost their retirement uh, health care benefits. And we, we have to stop that. Progressives have to stop. You can't call yourself a progressive and not fight mass layoffs and not fight Wall Street. You just can't. You can't say... Uh, oh, this is all okay, and the system's going to work itself out by itself. By itself, it doesn't. Left to itself, it 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 flows to the bottom, not to the top. It takes human will. Undo that regulation that allows those stock buybacks. Don't let them put debt on a company when they do a you know a, a leverage buyout, a corporate raid. Don't let them use borrowed money. They have to use their own money. They play it completely differently. And there wouldn't be immediate mass layoffs. And the other big fiction, uh, then I'll, I'll stop pontificating here, is that, okay, get an education, get a job in high tech. This is what uh, we've told people to do. You know, maybe you can't do it, but your kids will do it. And then things will be fine. You'll have, sta- you have a bright new future, stable employment. Well, last year, the high tech industry did, you know, probably $100 billion in stock buybacks. How did they pay for it? They did 260,000 mass layoffs. 260,000 workers lost their jobs in the high tech sector through mass layoffs. Another 50,000 so far this year. This is the, these are the jobs of the future. And, uh, you know, don't get me going. Then people say, well, no, 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 you can't. It, it, it's AI, it's new technology that's doing it. Baloney. There's, there's no indication at all that any of these jobs are lost to AI. Oh, I take it back. Maybe the dismissal notices were, was, were sent to people through an AI type program. But that's not why these jobs were lost. Stock buybacks are why these jobs were lost. The history of technology is that it's, yes, jobs change, but it's over a much slower period of time. There have been dozens of studies done on technology. That's not the driver of mass layoffs and job insecurity now. By the way, I don't think trade is either. I think it's the deregulation of corporations. Of course, the corporate trade agreements, the kind of which uh, you're very familiar with uh, uh, that have taken place over the years. This all can be stopped. Human will uh, created this. Human agency created this. Human agency can stop it. But we need a movement to to deal with it. And that's got to be built. So, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans in every election fight over this very narrow slice of the electorate, the kind of undecided voter, uh, which we're seeing again. And as you point out in the book, they write off uh, whole segments of the electorate. Uh, I'm just going to read from the book. The Democrats currently are leaving behind somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of white working class non-Democrats who are moderately to very liberal on the most divisive social issues This translates into approximately 10 to 25 million socially liberal white working class people who are non-Democrats. Given how close elections currently are, neglecting these workers should be considered political malpractice. I'm really glad that you spotted that one. That was one of the most amazing findings we came up with because, uh, you know, we we broke the electorate. You know, there's data long term not like polling before an election long term voter surveys where you could break the electorate into like seven different political classifications so we put all the republican leaning people who are working white working class into one 
uh, pool. And then we ran all these questions uh, through that pool. And it was stunning. <laughs> you know, it was stunning how many of these rabid Republicans and heavily leaning Republicans were, in fact, socially liberal. But the thing that triggered them, the one problem with the with these long term surveys is, you know, they're not put together by people like you or Gretchen. Uh, you know, they, so they don't have a lot of job oriented questions, but they have a couple that hint that way. One was on environmental job loss and the other one was on trade job loss. And the responses to those questions went through the roof. People were really angry and worried about those kinds of uh, issues. So that, again, I think goes back to the fundamental point. There are millions of socially liberal so-called Republican conservatives who are freaked out about job loss and they, uh, they want some kind of job stability. Uh, and they don't, uh, you know, here's the other little thing we noticed. You know, we do a lot of work with uh, trade unions and uh, a lot of workshops. And what I've noticed is that when people feel that uh, the union can't protect them and that the Democrats can't protect them, they lean towards the Republicans figure, well, we might as well uh, do deregulation or something because that's the only group now that could help protect my job. Let's help the companies. Maybe they'll protect their jobs. That's what happens when you have only 6% of the private sector in trade unions. That's what happens when the Democratic Party doesn't fight against uh, mass layoffs. People start leaning to the company for some sort of protection. And we have to talk about trade deals because it was Clinton that pushed through NAFTA. It was Hillary Clinton that was trying to push through the TPP. These trade deals essentially break down barriers so that sweatshops in China, Vietnam, Mexico can mass produce products and they can be brought back into the United States uh, at, at virtually no cost. I mean, they drive the new GM trucks up for Monterey, Mexico. They still sell at the same price, but instead of the money going to workers, it goes in the pockets of uh, the CEOs and you know the upper echelon of these corporations, but these trade deals have been devastating uh, to the working class, and the working class knows it. Oh, absolutely. The idea of structuring a trade deal to enrich corporations is obviously why the corporations help write these trade deals, uh, and it goes uh, uh, even more so for you know, financial services, the Wall Street part of it. But we're finding that behind a lot of these trade deals. Uh, the drive for profits uh, to use them is not to fend off the competition, but actually to create more cash flow for the stock buybacks. I'd like to see somebody add a little clause to a trade deal that says, guess what? Uh, uh, you can use this trade deal, but you can't do any stock buybacks. We're not going to allow you to recycle uh, uh, money that you make back into uh into, into uh, stock buybacks. They're not going to allow you to lay off you know, the other things. And guess what? No forced layoffs. Uh, add, add those two things to a trade deal the way you could to federal contracts, and you change the way trade happens globally. But yes, they've been remarkably devastating. But in more recent years, they're often tied, like with Carrier, to the desire to get more cash flow for stock buybacks. So that little loophole that started in 1982, is you know they've driven a truck through it. The same Mack truck that's coming up from Mexico. I want to talk about the Republican Party. I thought this was a very important point in your book. You talk about McCarthy's, his ruthless anti-communist campaign, a campaign that most liberals also supported, Sidney Hook. I added that. That's not you. In less virulent forms, uh, the working class masses did not create the federal loyalty oaths instituted by President Truman's Democratic administration, and those masses did not create the blacklist that... Uh, harmed the careers of so many in government education in Hollywood for uh, McCarthyism was primarily an elite phenomenon, not a mass phenomenon. And y you say the same is true today. Explain what you mean. Yeah, I, I got turned on to this uh, reading a book called uh, The Intellectuals of McCarthy by Michael P. Rogan. And uh, the pluralists, the uh, uh, political science and uh, sociology establishment of, the, of basically the 50s and the 60s, we're trying to explain how did totalitarianism rise? Why do you have Mussolini and Stalin and Hitler? Uh, 
Uh, and then McCarthy. Uh, these these people have no, you know, uh, trash minorities, uh, trash uh, all kinds of uh, uh, rights, uh, civil rights of, of all kinds. Why do you have them? Well, the theory, simply put, was masses run wild. That this happens because the masses run wild. And the proof of, of McCarthy's masses run wild was Wisconsin was a populist state. It had a lot of uh, had a populist governor, congressman, had a socialist mayor in, in uh, Milwaukee, and it grew out of the populist movement of the 1880s and 1890s and flowed into, and, and, and it still had remnants of that. And that's, and McCarthy was popular in Wisconsin, and therefore the masses run wild explains McCarthyism. Well, this guy Rogan did something, uh, which you know I tried to emulate in writing this book, which is let's take a look at what actually happened in the voting patterns. And he looks at the old populist districts, and it turns out they voted against McCarthy. That's not where he got his strength. Uh, the ideology didn't come from the populists. The ideology came from the conservative Republican intellectuals. The, the, the base, the, 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 the most fervent part of his base were the small towns, doctors, lawyers, you know, uh, 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 real estate agents and such. And uh, uh, his popular and, and he then picks it up another level. He says, as soon the elites allowed him to do what he did in Washington, you know, his hearings, his attacks, you know, his ruining people's careers. As soon as he started to attack the army, Eisenhower, for the first time, turned on him, and in six months, McCarthy was gone. For example, had the Republicans turned on Trump, we wouldn't be talking about him anymore, right? He was. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. So uh, his claim was it's an elite phenomenon. So we then started to look at, well, let's take, you mentioned January 6th. Well, let's take a look at that. Well, there's been some great work. I mean, on, on the surface, it looks like it's a white working class riot and it would support this pluralist argument that it's the masses run wild. Uh, well, it turns out that the University of Chicago has a project where they look at uh, the demographic characteristics of those people who are uh, arrested. And they're disproportionately white collar business and business owners. Let me just read the figures. I have them right in front of me. Ninety three percent were white. Fifty four percent were white collar or business owners. Only twenty two percent were blue collar, non business owners, no college degree, and twenty five percent had a college degree. I mean, it 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 makes sense. What I see when I look at uh, uh, Trump, I see a basket full of lawyers. You know, thousands of well, them. Well, they're pretty deplorable. <laughs> right? there, there thousands of them. I mean, that's that's his that's the guts of his his power structure. You know, I I don't see anybody. I don't see a working class person standing up uh, anywhere uh, up front. You know, yeah, they 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 put them in their audiences and stuff like that to make it look a certain way. But uh, and he's got you know he gets a lot of rural support, but that's not the guts of his movement. Uh, and so I think that there's a strong parallel between him and uh, McCarthy. And I think it's the same thing. If the elite uh, opinion makers uh, uh, in his own party and uh, let him run, run wild, which they clearly have done, you're going to have him uh, succeed. Not, right, well, not, they, I, but they, they stoke it because their actual policies have no popular support. I mean, there's, there's a reason they stoke this stuff. See, I think if we just dig down one more level, uh, what is the motivation for for each of these people? Well, I'm sure it's slightly different, but one of the clear motivations is money and power. And riding Trump's coattails, if you see a path to money and power, you're going to do it. And if nothing's blocking it, you're going to keep doing it. And the policies that you support are money and policy, money and power policies, right? Policies that uh, uh, you think you're going to get good donations, good jobs in the future, uh, prominence, uh, you know, fame, power, and glory. Uh, you know, there, I don't see, you know, there are a few, I'm sure, you know, Republicans that real, actually believe what they're saying. But, you know, I have trouble. Uh, I think what they're really saying is I want fame, power, and glory. And uh, this is the way I'm going to get it. Well, as you point out in the book, the, however uneasy that relationship might be, sometimes the business community in Nazi Germany had no problem working with the fascists, especially since after May Day, they shut down uh, all the unions, capitalism, 
uh, and as you point out in China, uh, can uh, function quite uh, well with totalitarianism. I, I just want to read this paragraph. For, for Democrats and the media to blame the white working class for this dereliction of duty by Republican elites is to make the same mistake the pluralists made with McCarthyism. The white working class does not have the franchise on authoritarianism, racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, religious intolerance, or violence. Authoritarianism can only irreparably damage society if political leaders refuse to hold the authoritarians to account. Liberals, too, can become unwitting enablers by blaming the white working class for the sins of these elites. Good paragraph. Yeah, well, you wrote it. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I stand by it, you know. It, but you nailed it. I mean, that's it. And that is the the kind of the most uh, uh, crucial political uh, problem uh, of our time in that uh, uh, unless the Democratic Party is willing to accept responsibility, uh, we're finished. I mean, when Trump comes back into power, and he may very well come back into power, it isn't going to be like the last time. And it, 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 it's, it's really going to be, uh, you know, it's going to become a banana republic. Well, look, we're, uh, you know, I came up through the 1960s. And, you know, let's face it, there, were, there was a lot of chaos going on there. And there was a lot of struggle. But I never thought that the democratic system itself was going to break, even with, you know, all the bombings and the assassinations. Uh, I mean, it was just, an, you know, like 1968, you know, I never want to live through that again. Uh, and I was, you know, I was at the Democratic National Convention. I was in the South. You know, it, I, I saw it firsthand, but I, I, I had faith in the underlying uh, support that people had for democracy. I, I'm worried now. Because after 40 years of job instability, uh, you've now threatened the very essence of how what people need to live to live, to not you know to not spiral down. You know the death spiral you talked about for a community is also the death spiral for each person. Feels you know uh, really letting their family down, letting themselves down. 40 years of this, and uh, I, I think that this system is now threatened. My I, I, I hate to pin all my hopes on a uh, uh, on the labor movement, but that's where I am. And I I think that Sean Fain at the UAW is on to something. He's the first labor leader in decades that speaks for the class as a whole when he talks. I mean, when he got up and said, you know, billionaires should not exist, just like that. Uh, that's a sign to me that he understands that a movement can be built. What I'd like to see him do is to create, a, in a sense, a nonpartisan political movement for like a dollar a month or something. Anybody can join and a very simple platform. No more mass layoffs, no more stock buybacks, no more leverage buyouts. You know, uh, uh, very simple. I think millions of people would join and that would give him leads to organize. Look, I'm trying to get into the ear of his, you know, his, his uh, assistants and comrades, but uh uh, something has to break where another movement gets built because there are not enough Sherrod Browns or Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. They're just not enough. Uh, uh, and to get them to be enough, you need something to, I think, come up from below. And uh, what I saw, I, I was impressed with what happened with the UAW. And it was also the Communication Workers of America are very, very good. By the way, they 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 run courses for a thousand workers a year based on my runaway inequality book and now based on this book as well. Uh, they really, day long courses, they spend like a million dollars a year educating their own members uh, to, to run through these courses. That there's some hope there, but we need well, that's, to that's what a lot of people forget. One of the fundamental roles of labor in society is education. Exactly. That was a trusted source of information. Uh, it still is a trusted source, but with only six percent of the pri of the business sector and unions, we got problems. We're better off in the public sector, but you, you need that uh, uh, private sector organized. And you know where, where you started this conversation with the NLRB laws, 
you know, if, if that goes, uh, you know, you're not going to see hardly any more union organizing and you're into uh, uh, the modern form of feudalism. You're back to the Mother Jones period yeah. where you can't you can't organize. It's going to be against the law to organize. And uh, we can't head in that direction. Uh, you know, uh, the scary thing is you've got a guy like ja- Jamie Demon, right, from uh, uh, CEO of uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase supposedly liberal guy he says oh we can work with we can work with trump he's already said it <laughs> lloyd blankfein said if bernie sanders was the nominee he'd work for trump one of a major democratic party donor well, what's interesting the uaw strike was really popular it's been a long time since a strike was actually uh majoritarian support for a strike so there's something out there where people you know it's that basic system i a little model I put forth before. If you've got all the power with corporations and the Democrats aren't protecting you, then you got to have at least a union. People, you know, the, the Starbucks workers, you know, we're working with these uh, Amazonian United workers right now providing education. You know, they understand. Uh, they're telling me I'm too conservative. I'm not attacking capitalism enough. These workers are totally comfortable attacking it because they're living it every day. Uh, you know, they're basically, uh, uh, throw away people. They're treated like just, you can just toss them away, work them to death and then get somebody else. Uh, we need it. We need some sort of an uprising, you know, uh, that is structured, you know, uh, not another, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tahir Square, uh, Arab Spring, uh, 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 or the, you know, uh, 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 you know, we are the 99%. We need it structured. Uh, you need an organization that actually has the uh, infrastructure to hold us together. Uh, and well, to- but we also need an organization that has the power to strike, because that's the only weapon working class people have to fight against their overlords. That's it, the strike. Yeah, they, if they take that away, you're going to see violence. Well, that's what uh, we're watching it right now with the NLRB. That's what they're doing. Anyway. All right. On that I'm trying to be a little note. optimistic. I'm trying for the listeners here. I'm trying to be optimistic. The book's not as pessimistic as we are being right now. But oh, I don't know. I, I think we better face what what's in front of us. Oh, you're right. We're not going to resist right. by selling hope. That's not our job. Our job is to sell truth, not and sell also, it. But you but can't build it. something unless you face up to no, what you. you I learned that in war. You know, people had a Pollyannish view of their own immortality. Didn't live too long. Uh, we, we have to, we have to see what's in front of us and then we have to resist. Well, but I, I I highly recommend your book. I think you nailed it. I think it's a really, really important book. And I want to thank you for writing it. Uh, that was Les Leopold, co-founder of the Labor Institute and author of Wall Street's War on Workers, How Mass Layoffs and Greed Are Destroying the Working Class and What to Do About It. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.